section twenty one chapters fifty nine through sixty one of the three sisters by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty nine wednesday was still the vicar's day for visiting his parish it was also rowcliffe's day for visiting his daughter but the vicar was not going to change it on that account on wednesday if it was a fine afternoon she was always sure of having rowcliffe to herself rowcliffe himself had become the creature of unalterable habit she was conscious now of the normal pulse of time a steady pulse that beat with a large rhythm a measure of seven days from wednesday to wednesday she filled the days between with reading and walking and parish work there had been changes in garthdale mr grierson had got married in one of his bursts of enthusiasm and had gone away his place had been taken by mr macy the strenuous son of a durlingham grocer mr macy had got into the church by sheer strenuousness and had married strenuously a sharp and sallow wife between them they left very little parish work for gwenda she had become a furious reader she liked hard stuff that her brain could bite on it fell on a book and gutted it throwing away the trash she read all the modern poets and novelists she cared about english and foreign they left her stimulated but unsatisfied there were not enough good ones to keep her going she worked through the elizabethan dramatists and all the vicar's tudor classics and came on jowett's translations of the platonic dialogues by the way and was lured on the quest of ultimate reality and found that there was nothing like thought to keep you from thinking she took to metaphysics as you take to dram drinking she must have strong heavy stuff that drugged her brain and when she found that she could trust her intellect she set it deliberately to fight her passion at first it was an even match for gwenda's intellect like her body was robust it generally held its ground from thursday morning till tuesday night but the night that followed wednesday afternoon would see its overthrow this wednesday it fought gallantly till the very moment of stephen's arrival she was still reading bergson and her brain struggled to make out the sense and rhythm of the sentences across the beating of her heart after seven years her heart still beat at stephen's coming it remained an excitement and adventure for she never knew how he would be sometimes he hadn't a word to say to her and left her miserable sometimes after a hard day's work he would be tired and heavy she saw him middle-aged and her heart would ache for him sometimes he would be young almost as he used to be she knew that he was only young for her he was young because he loved her she had never seen him so with mary sometimes he would be formal and frigid he talked to her as a man talks to a woman he is determined to keep at a distance she hated stephen then as passion hates he had come before now in a downright bad temper and was the old irritable stephen who found fault with everything she said and did and she had loved him for it as she had loved the old stephen it was his queer way of showing that he loved her but he had not been like that for a very long time he had grown gentler as he had grown older to-day he showed her more than one of his familiar moods she took them gladly as so many signs of his unchanging nature he still kept up his way of coming in the careful closing of the door the slight pause there by the threshold the look that sought her and that held her for an instant before their hands met she saw it still as the look that pleaded with her while it caressed her that said i know we oughtn't to be so pleased to see each other but we can't help it can we it was the look of his romantic youth as long as she saw it there it was nothing to her that rowcliffe had changed physically that he moved more heavily that his keenness and his slenderness were going that she saw also a slight thickening of his fine nose a perceptible slackening of the taut muscles of his mouth and a decided fullness about his jaw and chin she saw all these things but she did not see that his romantic youth lay dying in the pathos of his eyes and that if it pleaded still it pleaded forgiveness for the sin of dying his hand fell slackly from hers as she took it it was as if they were still on their guard still afraid of each other's touch as he sat in the chair that faced hers he held his hands clasped loosely in front of him and looked at them with a curious attention as if he wondered what kind of hands they were that could resist holding her 
when he saw that she was looking at him they fell apart with a nervous gesture they picked up the book she had laid down and turned it his eyes examined the title page their pathos lightened and softened it became compassion they smiled at her with a little pitiful smile half tender half ironic as if they said poor gwenda is that what you're driven to he opened the book and turned the pages reading a little here and there he scowled his look changed it darkened it was angry resentful inimical the dying youth in it came a little nearer to death rowcliffe had found that he could not understand what he had read huh. what do you addle your brains with that stuff for he said it amuses me oh so long as you're amused he pushed away the book that had offended him they talked about the vicar about alice about rowcliffe's children about the changes in the dale the coming of the macy's and the going of young grierson he wasn't a bad chap grierson he softened remembering grierson i can't think why you didn't care about him and at the thought of how gwenda might have cared for grierson and hadn't cared his youth revived it came back into his eyes and lit them it passed into his scowling face and caressed and smoothed it to the perfect look of reminiscent satisfaction rowcliffe did not know neither did she how his egoism hung upon her passion how it drew from it food and fire he raised his head and squared his shoulders with the unconscious gesture of his male pride it was then that she saw for the first time that he wore the black tie and had the black band of mourning on his sleeve oh stephen what do you wear that for this my poor old uncle died last week not the one i saw when at mary's wedding no another one my father's brother he paused it's made a great difference to me and mary he said it gravely mournfully almost she looked at him with tender eyes i'm sorry stephen he smiled faintly sorry are you yes if you cared for him i'm afraid i didn't very much it's not as if i'd seen a lot of him you said it's made a difference so it has he's left me a good four hundred a year oh that sort of difference my dear girl four hundred a year makes all the difference it's no use pretending that it doesn't i'm not pretending you sounded sorry and i was sorry for you that was all at that his egoism winced it was as if she had accused him of pretending to be sorry he looked at her sharply his romantic youth died in that look silence fell between them but she was used to that she even welcomed it stephen's silences brought him nearer to her than his speech essie came in with the tea-tray he lingered uneasily after the meal glancing now and then at the clock she was used to that too she also had her eyes on the clock measuring the priceless moments is anything worrying you stephen she said presently why do i look worried not exactly but you don't look well i'm getting a bit rusty that's what's the matter with me i want some hard work to rub me up and put a polish on me and i can't get it here i've never had enough to do since i left leeds harker was a wise chap to stick to it it would do me all the good in the world if i went back then she said you'll have to go stephen she did not know in her isolation that rowcliffe had been going about saying that sort of thing for the last seven years she thought it was the formidable discovery of time you ought to go if you feel like that about it why don't you i don't know you do know she did not look at him as she spoke so she missed his bewilderment you know why you stayed stephen he understood he remembered the dull red of his face flushed with the shock of the memory do i he said i made you his flush darkened but he gave no other sign of having heard her i don't know why i'm staying now he rose and looked at his watch i must be going home he said he turned at the threshold i forgot to give you mary's message she sent her love and she wants to know when you're coming again to see the babies oh some day soon you must make it very soon or they won't be babies any more she's dying to show them to you she showed them to me the other day she says it's ages since you've been and if she says it is she thinks it is gwenda was silent i'm coming all right tell her well but what day we'd better fix it don't come on a tuesday or a friday i'll be out i must come when i can chapter sixty 
she went on a tuesday she had had tea with her father first meal-time had become sacred to the vicar and he hated her to be away for any one of them she walked the four miles going across the moor under carva and loitering by the way and it was past six before she reached morfe she was shown into the room that was once rowcliffe's study it had been mary's drawing-room ever since last year when the second child was born and they turned the big room over the dining-room into a day nursery mary had made it snug and gay with cushions and shining florid chintzes there were a great many things in rosewood and brass a piano took the place of rowcliffe's writing-table a bureau and a cabinet stood against the wall where his bookcases had been and a tall palm-tree in a pot filled the little window that looked on to the orchard she had only to close her eyes and shut out these objects and she saw the room as it used to be she closed them now and instantly she opened them again for the vision hurt her she went restlessly about the room picking up things and looking at them without seeing them in the room upstairs she heard the cries of rowcliffe's children bumping and the scampering of feet she stood still then and clenched her hands the pain at her heart was like no other pain it was as if she hated rowcliffe's children presently she would have to go up and see them she waited mary was taking her own time upstairs the doors opened and shut on the sharp grief of little children carried unwillingly to bed gwenda's heart melted and grew tender at the sound but its tenderness was more unbearable to her than its pain the maid-servant came to the door mrs rowcliffe says will you please go upstairs to the night nursery miss gwenda she can't leave the children that was the message mary invariably sent she left the children for hours together when other visitors were there she could never leave them for a minute when her sister came unless stephen happened to be in then mary would abandon whatever she was doing and hurry to the two in the last year gwenda had never found herself alone with stephen for ten minutes in his house if mary couldn't come at once she sent the nurse in with the children upstairs in the night nursery mary sat in the nurse's low chair her year-old baby sprawled naked in her lap the elder infant stood whining under the nurse's hands mary had changed a little in three and a half years she was broader and stouter the tender rose had hardened over her high cheekbones her face still kept its tranquil brooding but her slow grey eyes had a secret tremor they were almost alert as if she were on the watch and mary's mouth with its wide turned back lips had lost its subtlety it had coarsened slightly and loosened under her senses continual content gwenda brushed mary's mouth lightly with the winged arch of her upper lip mary laughed you don't know how to kiss she said if you're going to treat baby that way and molly too gwenda stooped over the soft red down of the baby's head to gwenda it was as if her heart kept her hands off rowcliffe's children as if her flesh shrank from their flesh while her lips brushed theirs in tenderness and repulsion but seeing them was always worse in anticipation than reality for there was no trace of rowcliffe and his children the little red-haired white-faced things were all carteret molly the elder had a look of ally sullen and sickly as if some innermost reluctance had held back the impulse that had given it being even the younger child showed fragile as if implacable memory had come between it and perfect life gwenda did not know why her fierceness was appeased by this unlikeness nor why she wanted to see mary and nothing but mary in rowcliffe's children nor why she refused to think of them as his she only knew that to see rowcliffe and mary's children would have been more than her flesh and blood could bear you've come just in time to see baby in her bath said mary i seem to be always in time for that well you're not in time to see stephen he won't be home till nine at least i didn't expect to see him he told me he'd be out she saw the hidden watcher in mary's eyes looking out at her when did he tell you that last wednesday the watcher hid again suddenly appeased mary busied herself with the washing of her babies she did it thoroughly and efficiently with no sentimental tendernesses but with soft sensual paddings and strokings of the white satin smooth skins and when they were tucked into their cots and disposed of for the night mary turned to gwenda come into my room a minute she said mary's joy was to take her sister into her room 
and watch her to see if she would flinch before the signs of stephen's occupation she drew her attention to these if gwenda seemed likely to miss any of them we've had the beds turned she said the light hurt stephen's eyes i can't say i like sleeping with my head out in the middle of the room why don't you lie the other way then my dear stephen wouldn't like that oh what a mess my hair's in she turned to the glass and smoothed her disordered waves and coils while she kept her eyes fixed on gwenda's image there appraising her clothes her slenderness and straightness the set of her head on her shoulders the air that she kept up of almost insolent adolescence she noted the delicate lines on her forehead and at the corners of her eyes she saw that her small defiant face was still white and firm and that her eyes looked violet blue with the dark shadows under them time was the only power that had been good to gwenda she ought to look more battered mary thought she does carry it off well and she's only two years younger than i am it's her figure really not her face she's got more lines than i have but if i wore that long straight coat i should look awful in it it's all very well for you she said you haven't had two children no i haven't but what's all very well the good looks you contrive to keep my dear nobody would know you were thirty-three i shouldn't molly if you didn't remind me every time mary flushed you'll say next that's why you don't come why i don't come yes it's been ages since you've been here that was always mary's cry i haven't much time molly for coming on the off chance the off chance as if i'd never asked you you can go to alice poor ally wouldn't have anybody to show the baby to if i didn't you haven't seen one of ally's babies i can't gwenda i must think of the children i can't let them grow up with little greatorexes there are three of them aren't there didn't you know there'd been another stephen did tell me she had rather a bad time hadn't she she had molly it wouldn't do you any harm now to go and see her i think it's horrid of you not to it's such rotten humbug why you used to say i was ten times more awful than poor little ally there are moments gwenda when i think you are moments you always did think it you think it still and yet you'll have me here but you won't have her just because she's gone a technical howler and i haven't you haven't but you'd have gone a worse one if you'd had the chance gwenda raised her head you know molly that that isn't true i said if i suppose you think you had your chance then i don't think anything except that i've got to go you haven't you're going to stay for dinner now you're here i can't really mary but mary was obstinate whether her sister stayed or went she made it hard for her she kept it up on the stairs and at the door and at the garden gate perhaps you'll come some night when stephen's here you know he's always glad to see you the sting of it was in mary's watching eyes for when you came to think of it there was nothing else she could very well have said chapter sixty one that year when spring warmed into summer gwenda's strength went from her she was always tired she fought with her fatigue and got the better of it but in a week or two it returned rowcliffe told her to rest and she rested for a day or two lying on the couch in the dining-room where ally used to lie and when she felt better she crawled out onto the moor and lay there one day she said to herself there's ally i'll go and see how she's getting on she dragged herself up the hill to upthorne it was a day of heat and hidden sunlight the moor and the marshes were drenched in the grey june mist the hillside wore soft vapour like a cloak hiding its nakedness at the top of the three fields the nave of the old barn showed as if lifted up and withdrawn into the distance but it was no longer solitary the thorn-tree beside it had burst into white flower it shimmered far off under the mist in the dim green field like a magic thing half hidden and about to disappear remaining only for the hour of its enchantment it gave her the same subtle and mysterious joy that she had had on the night she and rowcliffe walked together and saw the thorn-trees on greffington edge white under the hidden moon the grey farmhouse was changed for jim greatorex had got on he had built himself another granary on the north side of the mistal he built it long and low of hewn stone with a corrugated iron roof and he had made himself two fine new rooms a dining-room and a nursery one above the other within the blind walls of the house where the old granary had been 
the walls were blind no longer for he had knocked four large windows out of them and it was as if one half of the house were awake and staring while the other half in its old and alien beauty dozed and dreamed under its scowling mullions as gwenda came to it she wondered how the farm could ever have seemed sinister and ghost-haunted it had become so entirely the place of happy life loud noises came from the open windows of the dining-room where the family were at tea the barking of dogs the competitive laughter of small children a gurgling and crowing and spluttering but now and then the sudden delicate laughter of ally and the bellowing of jim oh there's gwenda said ally jim stopped between a bellowing and a choking for his mouth was full ay it's her he washed down his mouthful come ally and open the door to her but ally did not come she had her year-old baby on her knees and was feeding him at the door of the old kitchen jim grasped his sister-in-law by the hand that's right he said you've just come in time for a cup of tea the missus is in there with the little ones he jerked his thumb toward his dining-room and led the way there jim was not quite so alert and slender as he had been he had lost his savage grace but he moved with his old directness and dignity and he still looked at you with his pathetic mystic gaze ally was contrite she raised her face to her sister to be kissed i can't get up she said i'm feeding baby he'd howl if i left off i'd let him howl i'd spank him if it was me said jim he wouldn't gwenda ay that i would and he knows it does johnny the young rascal gwenda kissed the four children jimmy and gwendolen alice and little stephen and the baby john they lifted little sticky faces and wiped them on gwenda's face and the happy din went on ally didn't seem to mind it she had grown plump and pink and rather like mary without her subtlety she sat smiling tranquil among the cries of her offspring jim turned three dogs out into the yard by way of discipline he and ally tried to talk to each other across the tumult that remained now and then ally and the children talked to gwenda they told her that the black and white cow had calved and that the blue lupins had come up in the garden that the old sow had died that jenny the chintz cat had kittened and that the lop-eared rabbit had a litter and baby's got another tooth said ally i'm breaking in the young chestnut said jim poor daisy's getting past her work all these happenings were exciting and wonderful to ally but you're not interested gwenda i am darling i am she was ally knew it but she wanted perpetual reassurance but you never tell us anything there's nothing to tell nothing happens oh come said ally how's papa much the same except that he drove into morfe yesterday to see molly yes darling of course you may ally was abstracted for gwenny had slipped from her chair and was whispering in her ear it never occurred to ally to ask what gwenda had been doing or what she had been thinking of or what she felt or to listen to anything she had to say her sister might just as well not have existed for all the interest ally showed in her she hadn't really forgotten what gwenda had done for her but she couldn't go on thinking about it forever it was the sort of thing that wasn't easy or agreeable to think about and ally's instinct of self-preservation urged her to turn from it she tended to forget it and she tended to forget all dreadful things such as her own terrors and her father's illness and the noises greatorex made when he was eating gwenda was used to this apathy of ally's and it had never hurt her till to-day to-day she wanted something from ally she didn't know what it was exactly but it was something ally hadn't got she only said have you seen the thorn trees on greffington edge and ally never answered she was heading off a stream of jam that was creeping down stevie's chin to plunge into his neck gwenda's asking you have you seen the thorn trees on greffington edge said greatorex he spoke to ally as if she were deaf she made a desperate effort to detach herself from stevie the thorn trees has anybody set fire to them a silly lass what about the thorn trees gwenda only that they're all in flower gwenda said she didn't know where it had come from the sudden impulse to tell ally about the beauty of the thorn trees but the impulse had gone she thought sadly they want me but they don't want me for myself they don't want to talk to me they don't know what to say they don't know anything about me they don't care really jim likes me because i've stuck to ally ally loves me because i would have given stephen to her they love what i was not what i am now nor what i shall be they have nothing for me it was jim who answered her i know he said i know 
oh you little little lamb baby john had his fingers in his mother's hair greatorex rose you'll not get much out of ally as long as the kids are about you'd best come with me into the garden and see the lupins she went with him he was silent as they threaded the garden path together she thought i know why i like him they came to a standstill at the south wall where the tall blue lupins rose between them vivid in the tender air and very still greatorex also was still his eyes looked away over the blue spires of the lupins to the naked hillside they saw neither the hillside nor anything between when he spoke his voice was thick almost as though he were in love or intoxicated i know what you mean about those thorn trees tisn't no earthly beauty what you see in em jim she said shall i always see it i dunno it comes and it goes does such like what makes it come what makes it come you know better than i can tell you if i only did know i'm afraid it's going i can tell you this for your comfort if you suffer enough maybe it'll come to you again if you're snug and happy sure as death it'll go he paused it hasn't come to me since i married ally she was wrong about jim he had not forgotten her he was not saying these things for himself he was saying them for her getting them out of himself with pain and difficulty it was odd to think that nobody but she understood jim and that nobody but jim had ever really understood her stephen didn't understand her any more than ally understood her husband and it made no difference to her and it made no difference to jim i'll tell you another queer thing it hasn't got much to do with good and bad the drink will not drive it from you and sin will not drive it from you so i reckon it's much the same thing as the grace of god did the grace of god go away from you when you were married jim maybe it would have if i'd run after it tis a tricky thing is god's grace but it's gone she said you gave your soul for ally when you married her he smiled i told her i'd give my soul to marry her he said end of section twenty one recording by expatria in bangor maine